looks like we can go ahead and get started if you want to greet our guests and we'll kick it off. Hey everybody, thank you for coming. You know, we love artists and um, we are very happy today to have this uh, Protecting Your Creativity Forum. And we have some very special guests here. My name is DeAndre Nixon. I'm the founder of In Education and the founder of the Battle of the Teal program. This is a Teal Forum. Welcome all. I hope you enjoy and we'll be following up with you after. Thank you. Hi, so I'm gonna take it from here and kick off and introduce our panelists. Um, my name is Jessica Payne. I am the Director of Community Programs at the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. I am also very proud to be staff liaison um, to, among many programs that the bar puts on, the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. Um, this is an organization that has been around since 1972. Um, it is an, a group of attorneys who want to give back to the arts. Um, their mission is to encourage a vibrant and thriving arts community in Cleveland, and they do that through knowing that um, the arts community often is going to need some legal help along the way. So they are proud to give back through either participating in public education forums, such as the one tonight. Um, they also do handle pro bono applications for legal help. So if you are an artist or an arts organization in um, Northeast Ohio, the greater Cleveland area, we definitely encourage you to reach out to us. I'm gonna put up my email address and the Bar Association's website, how to see more about the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. We call it VLA, so if we use that acronym, um, you'll know what we're talking about. Um, please do reach out for, to us if you would like a speaking engagement or you need some legal help, we are always happy to pitch in. Um, so with that, I would love to turn it over to our wonderful panel tonight for protecting your creativity. Um, the VLA, as I mentioned, does presentations like this numerous times throughout the year. Um, this is our second since the COVID shut down um, going over Zoom. So we are glad that you can join us tonight and um, hopefully find this as informative as we would like it to be. Um, so one of the things that VLA does is talks to students and people early off in their careers and helps them with the basics of how do you get going. Um, also prevention is where the pound of cure. So if you know how to protect your creativity and avoid violating other people's rights, you are automatically going to be in a much better situation, which is why we're bringing this to you here tonight. Um, we have our three wonderful panelists and I'm going to introduce them in the order that they are going to be speaking. First off, we've got Ed Kaja, who is an attorney from Walter and Havel Field, is a local um, law firm in Cleveland. He is going to be talking about intellectual property law. And Ed is, um, he is prior to joining Walter Haverfield, he um, developed what we would call a well-rounded aptitude for innovation counseling, and he has experience in various legal, business, and technical management positions across many organizational roles. Um, he also, of course, includes in his ex expertise, patent application preparation and prosecution. His legal experience also includes litigation assistance involving patents, trade secrets, business torts, and unfair competition in numerous arts fields. Any of those terms don't sound familiar? Have no fear, Ed's gonna talk about them. Next, we've got Claire Shin. Claire is currently a law student at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, but has a lot of experience in speaking and research in the law. So we're so excited to have her join us on a field and a topic that we haven't had much presentation in the past, but it is something that is very important and is um, developing even more and more today. She is a third year law student currently studying in Paris. Right now, she's currently in Paris. So thank you for joining us late in your evening, Claire. Um, she is the co-president of the Sports and Entertainment Law Society at Case Western Law. She plans on being a fashion attorney when she graduates in 2021. And her article, The Future of Fashion Law in America, Copyright as the Key to Creativity, has been published in an international fashion law journal. She's also a guest speaker at the Kent State University Fashion School. Last, but of course not least, is Katie Steiner, who is an attorney with Han Lozier Parks. Um, she is our current chair of the VLA committee for the CMBA, and she has handled multiple speaking engagements and pro bono representation as her way of giving back to the local arts community. Um, Katie's practice focuses on nonprofit law, art law, litigation, and intellectual property law. 
and she's assisted national brands with patent and trademark litigation and enforcement, especially in online marketplaces. Her commitment to arts clients stems from her previous professional background, where she served in museum curatorial positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Frick Collection in New York City. Um, so we couldn't be more pleased to have these three joining us. What I'm going to do is kick it off first to Ed, who's going to give us an intro and lead us into our topic tonight. But before I do so, really quickly, I'm just going to say to everybody, please, um, although our presenters are going to be giving us information, I very strongly encourage you to use the Q&A function in Zoom down at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be watching for that. We'll either incorporate it in if it's appropriate as our speakers are talking, or we're also going to reserve some time at the end to answer any questions that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, so please use that liberally. We want to hear from you. We don't want this to be a straight up lecture. Um, we would love to have some questions and answers and really be as useful as we can for you. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Ed. Thank you very much. Ed, you're going to want to unmute yourself. That and uh, capture the share, share the screen appropriately. Hopefully, um, people can see the screen, even though my, it says my interconnection is somewhat unstable. Um, first off, I wanted to say that I am humbled to be among creatives. I grew up in a large family, but I was tend to be a techno geek uh, type of person with very little what I would call creative skills of my own, although I appreciate them in other people. One of my uh, dearest brothers uh, was a artist in San Francisco, and uh, he has uh, material in the Smithsonian. And in a strange way, I can claim fame that I am mentioned because his audio history includes me by name. So in a sense, I am in the Smithsonian. Um, with that being said, uh, everyone loves acronyms, right? Uh, CMBA, VLA, PDQ, IANYA. Does anyone know what these are? Does, any, does anyone care to guess? Um, open for guesses. Actually, it's Cleveland Metro Bar uh, Association Volunteer Lawyer for the Arts. Jessica kind of gave that away. Pretty darn quick. This is a, a very, very uh, broad overview and I am not your attorney. The reason why I say that is uh, twofold. One, I am not your attorney. This is not a client attorney relationship. And two, it's important that you do not assume that you have attorney relationships. Uh, attorneys are bound by strict codes of ethics, but you should not be making any assumptions and you want to try to get your uh, agreements in writing. With that being said, I will continue here. So this, these are what I'll you know, cover at a, at a very quick pace here. Some simple laws. What do you want? What do creatives want? Some simple caveats to the, the laws of intellectual property. Some not so simple caveats, some, some trade-offs and some simple suggestions uh, that I will give for you to go to the source. Intellectual property. Uh, different laws for different things. Uh, intellectual property is a very broad concept. It covers a bunch of different things. Here you can see patents and patent pendings. The C in a circle is copyright. The R in the circle and the TM in the circle are, uh, are registered trademarks and trademarks in general. And I put that little um, warning sign there for trade secrets because they're kind of a secret, uh, but you know, nonetheless, uh, potentially powerful tool for people to have in promoting their business. So the, the different laws for different things that each form of IP is intended to protect things, different things at a 10,000 foot level. Patents are meant to protect utility. Uh, you have something that does something. You have a method of doing something. You have a chemical or a drug or a device that does something. So patents are protecting utility. Copyrights, on the other hand, protect expression, uh, ex uh, expressed ideas in film, in music, in a bunch of different areas, but copyrights are meant to protect expression of ideas. Uh, trademarks are uh, there to protect both businesses and the public from business con confusion. On the business side, you, you're able to uh, protect your identity as a particular source 
of a product or a service and that gives the the public a notice of the quality that you intend to, to have with that mark. Other people cannot do things that are confusingly similar to that and that's where the protection comes from. The public is protected in that when they go and they see a mark and they use it, they know that they're getting it from the registered or otherwise uh, trademark holder. Trade secrets, I put that purposely in, in kind of a, a hushed tones there. Trade secrets protect developed know-how. Those are internal to businesses and the consuming public generally is not aware of trade secrets. One aspect in all of this is you really look at, the, look at this from you personally and professionally, understanding your own plans. There is no single reason why any of these intellectual properties are good or bad or you should get them or not get them and they all depend on what you're trying to do. Um, when I counsel individual people, I look at risk and reward. And for, for myself, personally, I came from two, a couple different areas. First, I was uh, an engineer type, then I uh, went back to school, got an MBA, was in the management type. So for me, the easiest way to look at this is business plans. What are your business plans? What are you trying to do? What are your risks? What are your rewards? Where, where do you want to spend money? Where do you think you'll be getting money? Understanding that and as your intellectual property fits into that is probably the most important. Not planning is planning to fail. As I mentioned at the beginning, the first major simple caveat is I am not your attorney and this is not legal advice and why I say this. As I mentioned, attorneys operate under a strict code of ethics. New clients mean sometimes that I cannot take other clients because I have your interest at heart. So when you're talking to an attorney and you're, you're wanting to, to tell them everything, attorneys will be a little uh, perhaps standoffish. That is not to be impersonal. It is to protect you and to protect them. Money and why bother? Again, this goes to the business plan. Money is the root of property portion of the intellectual property. And, and, and therefore that's one of the drivers and simple caveats here. In a nutshell, copyright is probably the easiest to obtain, but carries the thinnest protection. I know that uh, our other speakers will talk a, a, a bit more on copyright, um, but just, to, just at the simplest level, copyright is very easy to obtain. Patents are perhaps the most difficult to obtain, but they also may serve as the strongest, but even this has its own caveats because sometimes what was once a strong Cat, uh, strong patent changes over time because of what the courts or what Congress may do. Um, VIN uh, might be uh, worth an explanation. VIN is, uh, for example, fair use uh, is a good co legal concept. You may have a copyright, but that doesn't mean that you can prevent anyone and everyone from looking at or using or, or re referencing your copyright. Uh, there's a number of different factors in fair use. It's very fact intensive and it gets very deep into the legal weeds very quickly. So on simple caveats, I'm not going to talk too much more about it. Um, on the strong side for patents, patents are like trespass. Intent is not required to have a transgression against the patent. Knowledge is not required. So you may be, you know, doing something or creating a utility all happy on your own and all of a sudden someone may come back in your door and say you cannot do that because I have a patent on that and they would be correct. Um, so there are items of, of patents and strengths in businesses if you are planning to scale up and spend a lot of money in a certain business area it might behoove you to, to do a patent search and a clearance search so that you know that you're operating without Go, stepping on someone else's intellectual property. On the trademark side, trademarks and trade secrets generally are more intricate from a legal standpoint with state by state as well as federal law effects. Um, trade secrets generally fall into the same type of areas of trademark law but does have some intersection with patent law. Again, as I mentioned, the, the simple caveats here is these are meant to protect both the source and the purchasing public. And that's probably the best takeaway 
from the trademark side is that type of protection. Secrets obviously do not protect the public, but have story and have historically been opposite the goal of patents. So as a patent attorney, I tend to frown upon them, um, but that's more from a, 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 a philosophical point of view. I do not frown upon them because that's an important aspect that my clients might need and use in protection of their business. So some of the not so simple caveats um, for all of the creatives that not pay attention in civics and other uh, boring classes while growing up. Yeah, that's, this is where it gets not so simple. The, the legal basis of protection and the government in general. Uh, I promise this won't be too painful. At the top of what I'm calling this pyramid here is we the people, that's the constitution. It is the source of all of our laws. Um, down at the bottom is the actual people and in between you have all these layers and policies um layers and policies and policies include both federal and state governments we actually live under two different sovereigns i'm not sure many people right realize that state rights may provide differences especially in areas what of what are called non-preemption patents and trademarks are preemptive states do not have patent systems states do not have copyright systems only the federal government has each of those. Copyright systems, though, may be state-based, may be regional-based, so that makes it a little bit more tricky. Um, also, as far as the we, the people, the other uh, historical item, the Declaration of Independence, uh, uh, interesting note there, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the catchphrase of the Declaration of Independence. That actually stems from a slightly modified phrase of life, liberty, and property. Intellectual property has a strong tie to the beginning of our, uh, of our uh, government based in some of those concepts there. So the not so simple concepts on the legal basis of protection for patents and copyrights is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution. There won't be a test, you don't have to remember that. Uh, the examination and general requirements, there's a keep out what you may or may not be able to do or protect. Again, I'm going to broad brush stroke this. The, these are just to give you the kind of a, a flavor for the fact that these things can get complex pretty quickly. As I mentioned, um, th this is a power that stems directly in our Constitution, uh, the Bill of Rights which I'm sure everyone is aware of as far as the First Amendment and your freedom of expression is actually an addendum to the Constitution and comes after Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. In general, patents for eligibility are types of things. Um, other other re general requirements are novelty, non-obviousness, enablement, and possession. Each of these are, are legal terms of art, and I won't go into too much, but I'll give you a uh, hint at the end of where you can actually read up on some of this at your, at your leisure. Um, in copyright, and original work, in a fixed medium, and creative expression are the general requirements. And the keep outs patents have many, and they're typically related to those requirements of type of eligibility, novelty, non-obviousness. Uh, the keep outs on the copyright side tend to also reflect the fixed and tangible medium, original creative, which though it tends to be a low bar and non-functionality. The legal basis protection uh, for, for trademarks, trade dress, trade secrets is a little bit different. It actually comes from the Commerce Clause, which is Clause 3. Again, there won't be a test, so you don't have to uh, worry about remembering that too much. The thing to remember here is that the Commerce Clause is actually a federal power to regulate commerce between the states. It is not preemptive, it is state to state. If you operate something that's completely within a state, you may not be as affected by this. Um, so again, preemption tends to be less here. Uh, trade secret does have a a federal registration power um, that they've wanted to put in. Trade secrets are moving that way, although it's not preemptive right now. So a lot of the stuff is a little bit more complex actually because there's not a single government basis for these types of items. Uh, trademark general requirements, actual or intent to use in commerce, 
And of course, the most important one is distinctness or, or the ability to distinguish source. Um, there are a, a number of keepouts based on those uh, concepts. Trade secrets, the, you know, the important thing there is business value added, measures in place to protect secrecy. Uh, once legitimately known, uh, trade secrets can become largely unenforceable. So that, you know, a very key part of the trade secrets and if uh, you're involved in litigation on trade secrets the aspect is what were the measures you took to make sure that you maintain secrecy. Um, and, and trademarks and the keepouts, notably uh, keepouts are sim you know, confusingly similar marks, misdescriptive marks, uh, and generic marks. And I'm sure our other speakers will touch upon those in, in, in more detail and more interesting detail. Uh, trade secrets, there's not many keep outs, but you must maintain and must provide business value. Trade offs. I, I um, included a, a little circles and then I pushed the circles apart so far they didn't even show up on, on the thing. Uh, generally speaking, a lot of people look at the, the three areas of patents, copyrights, as trademarks as having no overlap. There are actually exceptions to that rule which makes them for interesting uh, legal discussions for geeks like me. And unfortunately for some people who get caught up in those legal, legal snares. So again, it, that's a very intricate part and not part of this, but, but be aware that even though most people do talk about them as being completely separate, there, there is possible overlap. Um, patents, like I mentioned, are powerful, but typically expensive. Copyrights are easy, but have been coverage and are probably the least expensive, and trademarks um, are tied to legitimate business. And the actual use in commerce, intent to use in commerce, those are important aspects of trademarks. Trade secrets, a variety of complex issues, but potentially unending protection. If, as long as you can keep it a secret, you, you, can, you can keep it a secret. It's a, it's a trade secret. The notable thing on all of these items is that each of these are up to you to police and enforce. Some people get a patent, they pay a lot of money for the patent, and then they you know, are puzzled when they find out that someone's violating their rights. And it's like, well, what, what happens? It's like, okay, you get to sue them. You get to spend money to enforce your patents and copyrights and trademarks, not the government. The government will give you these, will give you the rights, but all this is still up to you to police and enforce. Part of this comes in my counseling with people talking about the business plan. In a business plan, you want to set aside funds to obtain your rights, but you also want to set up funds to enforce your rights. And enforcement of rights is sometimes as much or many times more expensive than obtaining your rights. So those are important factors to realize right off the bat. With that, I wanted to go to the source and I wanted to come back to this. Uh, these are the main URLs to get the, the sources, but I wanted to um, come back to that if I can and go to a couple URLs here. USBTO uh, dot G, uh, GOV. Landing screen has some very good basics, how to maintain, how to apply, some application assistance if you're doing this pro se. And I see that I've lost screen share, so let me try this again. I think I'm back with screen share. Excellent. Uh, so the USPTO um, Patent and Trademark Office, oddly enough, patents and trademarks are in the same office, even though they are they derive from different constitutional provisions. And of course, it shows that the trademark uh, basics have very similar look and feel. Trademark basics, how to search, how to apply. Uh, the copyright landing page is actually run out of the, uh, the Library of Congress. They have their own IT department. They have their own setups. A little bit different look and feel uh, for copyrights. Information on copyrights are called circulars. I'm not sure why, but they uh, have all kinds of foundations of copyright information, office practice and procedure circulars, um, and even they have an update grid and matrix of which circular might give you information that you're looking for. 
As I mentioned, trade secrets are a bit more different. Those are run almost strictly state by state. Here is a screenshot of Ohio laws and rules for, for Ohio's implementation of what was called a Uniform Trade Secrets Act definitions. And this then leads into other items of trade secrets. With that, I am done. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ed. I see that we don't have any questions so far. I, again, want to encourage anybody, we'll take a couple of seconds right now. If you have any questions about the basics that Ed just went over, um, or if you want to think about it and present it at the end, that's fine as well. Um, not seeing any questions pop up, I am next going to turn it over to our wonderful Claire. And she is going to be talking to us today about legal issues in fashion law. So, bonjour and thank you, Claire, for joining us again. I'm sorry, I just think it's cool that you're joining us from Paris. So, take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, we're making this very international. So, let me just try to share my screen. Is everyone seeing it all right? Okay, perfect. So with that great introduction and so much detailed history that Ed has given us, I wanted to transition this into something that we are more familiar with and that is why I chose fashion law because everyone, no matter if you're creative or not, participates in the fashion industry. No matter who you are, what age, where you live, we are all part of this industry and we can't escape it. So I thought it would be a good way to transition. In the fashion industry, there are a lot of legal um, departments that come into play. There's, of course, intellectual property, which is what this presentation will focus on. There, but there's also contract law, labor and employment, immigration, real estate, international trade, and government regulations. So with trademarks, we are given the definition that it has to be any word, name, symbol, or device that is used to identify and distinguish a good from something else. So as you can see, Prada, Chanel, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, you see these logos and you know immediately where they come from, what kind of company it is, and what kind of brand it is. You know immediately the price range it's going to be. So you see that trademarks in itself have value. A logo has a value, so it is important to protect it as an international company. Then we have copyrights, which of course is like what Ed said, it has to be an original work of authorship, it has to be creative, but it also has to be tangible, which means it can't only be an idea. So it also has to fall into one of these eight categories, literary works, musical works, dramatic works, pantomimes, pictorial, graphic, sculptural works, motion pictures, sound recordings, architectural works. So we see that fashion is not included in any of these, um, any of these categories. So it makes copyright a bit more difficult when it comes to fashion because copyright also cannot you can't copyright anything that is functional. And as you know, clothing, shoes, sunglasses, bags can arguably have a functional use to them. So there's a huge issue with copyright and fashion, but that's for another time. And then we have trade dress, which is the design and shape of the materials in which a product is packaged. So over here, we have the very famous Birkin bag by Hermes. So as soon as you see the design and shape of this bag, you know what bag it is. And that is why it is a trade dress. And we have the patent, which is a useful machine, a composition of matter, just any improvements. So if you come up with a new fabric, uh, my friend recently uh, made a fabric that can eat plastic and release oxygen. So things like that would fall under patents. Now let's go a little deeper into trademarks. With trademarks, you have to have an actual intent to use or it has to be actually in use at the moment. It also has to be distinctive, which means it can't be very similar to a trademark that already exists. And like I said, it has to be non-functional and it cannot be in any of the can't be trademarks categories, which we'll get into later. 
And in order for you to determine what trademark is good and what trademark is bad for if you ever want to start your own company or your own brand, um, this is the category. The top being the best and the bottom being the worst. The line shows where you can trademark and where you cannot trademark. So above the line where you can trademark, the best thing is fanciful, a word that never existed before. Those are easy to trademark and very easily, easy to defend and enforce. Arbitrary trademarks are things that are not normally associated with the word that it is defined as. So for example, apple is a fruit, but now we associate that as computers and this whole other tech industry. So that is an arbitrary trademark. The next level is suggestive, which is something like copper tone. You can kind of guess from the name what the product is going to be. And here it's sunscreen or bronzer. And finally, descriptive with secondary meaning. If it is descriptive, it usually cannot be trademarked. For, for example, American Airlines, you know exactly what that is. However, after many years, um, it could develop a secondary meaning and consumers can automatically relate that trademark to the company. But you will have, the companies will have to prove this, so it might take some time. And on the bottom, again, we have descriptive without secondary meaning. You cannot trademark those. Or generic trademarks such as light beer for light beer cannot be trademarked. And this is the list of the trademarks uh, that cannot this is the list of categories of things that cannot be trademarked. So any living person's name without consent, uh, any marks that are very similar to something that's already famous, uh, any government's coat of arms or flags or insignias. And all the way at the bottom, we have immoral, deceptive or scandalous marks, which uh, we will talk about in a second. That used to be a requirement, but from now, um, that is no longer the case. And in this F-U-C-T case, we have this LA brand uh, called F-U-C-T, and they applied for a trademark, and of course they were denied, saying that uh, the trademark office said it was too scandalous. But uh, because of a previous case, they were able to argue that we are pronounced F-U-C-T, and this is our First Amendment right, you have no right to uh, not let us trademark our brand. So now F-U-C-T is an officially trademarked Los Angeles fashion brand. And we have the very famous red bottom sole shoes that everyone knows of. And I'm guessing everyone is thinking that these are the Christian Louboutin shoes. But actually, those red shoes are Yves Saint Laurent shoes. And they are not Christian Louboutins. So, of course, Christian Louboutin sues Yves Saint Laurent saying that red bottom sole shoes are their trademarks and they can't do that. The court came, oh, and Yves Saint Laurent was kind of smart because in that line of shoes, they made that the top of the shoe and the bottom of the shoe were the same color. So you see blue on the top, blue on the bottom, green on the top, green on the bottom, and red on top and red on the bottom. And the court decided that Louboutin um, does uh, have trademark on the red bottom sole as long as the top color and the bottom color are different. So it is possible for you to trademark a color. However, you really, really have to prove that this color is something that consumers automatically and really strongly associate with your brand. So we have things like Louboutin Red, Coca-Cola Red. We have John Deere Green. Uh, UPS Brown, Barbie Pink, Tiffany Blue. So these are all colors that you know immediately uh, what brand they come from. And now we have the very fun case of parody and inspirations. Are you allowed to make a parody by using another, tra uh, another company's trademark? So in this case, there's this company called My Other Bag. And they make very cheap um, canvas tote bags where on the one side has a very famous expensive bag and the other side it says my other bag, as in I left my other bag at home. So 
Louis Vuitton, of course, was not happy and sued my other bag. My other bag said, this is a parody. We all know this isn't the real Louis Vuitton. No one is going to carry gym shoes and carrots and groceries in Louis Vuitton bags. Come on. And the court agreed. The court said, yes, this is parody. You are allowed to make parodies. You are allowed to be inspired by trademarks. Again, you just have to make sure that you don't infringe upon the company's trademark too much. And we have our final topic on counterfeits. Uh, as you can see, counterfeits are a huge problem. 14,000 fake Nikes were seized in LA. And you see here that there are almost half a million jobs lost in the European Union. Um, annual sales lost is way too much. And you see the top five sec sectors for lost sales mostly comes from clothing and cosmetics, which is very much fashion related. So keep this in mind the next time you think about buying a counterfeit bag, all the jobs and the money that could be lost. And uh, yeah, this is my, this is the end of my presentation. Awesome, thank you so much, Claire. And I'm still seeing no questions. There's gotta be questions. That was a really good presentation on the basics and, and protecting your work and helping others. So um, feel free to add the questions at any point. Um, if there are none, we will, in the interest of keeping things moving, we will toss it over to Katie, who's gonna talk about something incredibly important for everybody to think about, social media for creatives. So Katie, take it away. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. First of all, can everyone hear me and see the slides that I'm sharing on the screen? Awesome. Okay. Um, so uh, in an effort to try to be respectful of everyone's time, I'm going to do my best to whiz through um, this material. But, um, you know, certainly if there are questions, um, you know, we'll do our best to reserve some time at the end. And, um, you know, we're certainly open to, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us if you do have questions after um, this presentation concludes. So, um, you know, I, I fully expect that uh, most, if not all, of our uh, guests who have tuned in today are um, aspiring artists, um, you know, creative people who are really trying to get a foothold, you know, within their creative community. Um, and one way to do that, or certainly an easy way to do that, and to try to um, raise your profile within your, your local creative community is to take to the internet um, and share, share your work. Work, um, you know, truly with a with a global audience via the internet and various social media platforms. Um, but um, you know, there are certain um, certain risks that are associated with sharing your work digitally online. Um, and so, uh, the point of this presentation is um, really there are really three topics that um, I would like to share over the next couple of minutes. The first is. As an aspiring artist, you know, someone who's, uh, you know, an emerging talent, um, you know, what, what are your rights? You know, trying to lay a, a bit of a foundation to understand, um, you know, wh what, what, your, what intellectual property rights um, vest in your work. And then secondly, um, the first of two topics, you know, trying to um, offer some practical advice for, okay, now that you understand what your rights are and what the limitations are, what are some smart ways that you can go about sharing your creative work online? Um, and then secondly, um, you know, focusing particularly on social media sites, what are some smart ways that you can use those social media platforms um, to share, but also you know, practical ways that you can try to protect your work, but then also understanding um, the terms and conditions that are associated with your use of those online platforms. Okay, so first things first, um, trying to, we're going to uh, try to set, set the stage here for um, what, what rights you have, um, you know, as a creative person, and specifically I'm focusing on what copyrights um, are available to you. So, First things first, uh, you know, to, 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 have a, to have a copyright, what exactly does that mean? What, like, what, what, is, what is in that realm? And both Claire and Ed kind of touched on this, but, but essentially you can get a copyright for a work that is original. 
Um, so that sort of begs the question, well, what does original really mean? Um, you know, this is a word or concept that's really open to interpretation. And what the courts have said is that really, um, uh, a work that has a modicum of creativity, so, so even works that have just a little itty bitty bit of creativity, those are still eligible for copyright protections. So, you know, you don't need to be, you know, Leonardo or Michelangelo or, you know, a Prince or something like that in order to, you know, to make something that blows everyone's minds, um, you know, that, that you can create something with this, with even just a small amount of creativity and still be eligible to get copyright protections for that expression. So the other thing, too, is it's important to recognize that um, originality and novelty are two separate concepts. So in other words, you don't have to be the first person to come up with an idea to still have a work that is original enough to merit copyright protections. So you'll see on the screen there, I've shared just a, a relatively random smattering of images of the Eiffel Tower um, in Paris that have all been taken from, uh, shout out to Claire, uh, that have all been taken from roughly the same angle. So here's an example of where you have a bunch of images that are not novel so right so everyone has kind of come up with the same idea however each image is arguably original in the sense that each has been taken from a slightly different angle they were taken during different weather conditions at different times of day with different passer passers-by in front you know crossing in front of the frame so arguably even though this is not a novel view to shoot there's still a certain amount of creative expression in each one of these photographs because the photographer had to make certain creative decisions about you know when and where and how they took this photograph okay so not only does your work need to be original or have that that teeny little bit of creativity in order to qualify for copyright protections but in addition the work also needs to be fixed so what does fixed mean? Um, essentially, that what that means is that your work needs to be recorded in some permanent or semi-permanent format. So to um, to fix, uh, you know, a, a drawing is fixed the minute you you know put pencil to paper, right? Your your drawing is now in this kind of permanent or semi-permanent format. Um, you know, when you uh, compose a poem on, uh, you know. Uh, your word processing software on your computer and you hit save, um, that, uh, that electronic file is a form of fixation. Um, by contrast, if you were to, for example, uh, get on your soapbox in Public Square in downtown Cleveland and deliver an extemporaneous political speech, um, that is not a fixed expression. It might be completely original, but it's not fixed unless you were to, for example, write it down. So it was only at that point that that expression would, would be eligible for copyright. So you need originality and you need fixation. Now, Claire touched on this, but you know, what, what types of works are eligible for copyright protection? Well, literary works, dramatic works, um, choreographic works, uh, motion picture films, music, and that includes both the composition, the musical composition, and any lyrics that are associated with that composition. And then finally, visual arts. Um, so, you know, uh, paintings, drawings, uh, sculpture, and also works of architecture are included in that as well. All right. So, Oh, great. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a creator. I have, uh, you know, made this original fixed expression. When, when do I get my copyright? Like, at, at what point does my copyright vest? Uh, like, when, when do I actually get that copyright? And the answer is, as soon as you have fixed that original, original expression, you have a copyright. So, you, um, it's important to understand that you do not need to register your copyright with the U.S. copyright in order to have copyright protections in your original expression. You know, as soon as you fix that original expression, right, like, as soon as you make that drawing, that original drawing, 
drawing on a sheet of paper, you have a copyright in that drawing. Um, you don't need to register it with the federal government or with a federal government agency. So then as a copyright holder, what like what rights are you entitled to as that copyright holder? And you do have, um, there's a certain universe of exclusive rights that you, you alone as the copyright holder are entitled to. Now, it's important to mention that you as the copyright holder also have the authority to license uh, permission to other people in order to, you know, give them permission to distribute, copy, you know, et cetera, your work. But the point is that you, you as the copyright holder have that exclusive right and, um, you know, folks need to come and ask you for permission before they just willy nilly go and, you know, copy and distribute your work. So, so yep, so you have the exclusive right to reproduce your work. Um, you know, to, to distribute it, um, to, you know, if it's a dramatic work or a musical work, the exclusive right to perform it. Um, if it's a visual work, to display your work. And then finally, to prepare derivatives. Um, and one way to kind of think about a derivative is to think about sequels. So let's say, for example, that you are, um, you're a big fan of Harry Potter and you want to write a work of fan fiction that uses the Harry Potter characters and some of the plot elements. Um, that, that is an example that would sort of be considered a sequel to Harry Potter, um, a derivative work um, using those copyrighted Harry Potter characters and plot lines. And so you would need, in this case, the copyright holders, uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, permission in order to create that derivative work. Like that, that is one of her, the exclusive rights that she holds. All right. Um, and so, you know, just because you have a copyright in your work, um, you know, does not make you the master of the universe. Uh, you know, there are to what you can, uh, you know, there, there are limits on the powers um, and the rights that you get as a copyright holder. So one of those limits is a time limit. And it's quite a generous time limit, but it's still something to be aware of. Um, your copyright lasts for your lifetime uh, plus 70 years. Um, so it's a it's generous timeline, but you should be aware that there are some time limits. Um, the other thing, and Claire, Claire touched on this in her presentation, but you can copyright your original work, that your expression, but you cannot get exclusive rights via your copyright to the underlying facts and ideas uh, that, that underpin your creative expression. So I can draw a picture of a tree and I can get copyright protection for for that drawing, but my copyright does not give me ownership control over all trees. So just because I, I have I have um, I have a right to my drawing of a tree, I don't have the power to restrict other people from using the idea of trees or other people making drawings of trees themselves. So you get protection for the expression, but not the underlying concepts or ideas. And then finally, um, I think both Ed and, uh, and Claire brought up this concept of fair use. We could devote an entire uh, hour just and, and more to talking about fair use. But what I'll say is that, um, again, even though you're the copyright holder, you cannot restrict others from using your copyrighted works under certain circumstances. So for example, if you're an educator um, and you're using someone's copyrighted work for educational teaching purposes, that qualifies as fair use. You cannot pursue them for an infringement claim. Um, you know, if, if uh, there's a reporter who is um, writing a critical piece about, you know, a show that you performed or a play that you wrote or a work of art that you put in a gallery, that criticism counts as fair use. Um, you know, the same goes for, Claire brought this up, but parodic works, um, you know, people who are poking fun at something that, you know, you've created, um, you know, that again falls under fair use um, and your exclusive rights uh, do not extend that far, you know, to the point where you can restrict those types of fair use. Hey, Katie, sorry yeah. to interrupt your flow for a second, but this actually seems like a perfect place to address one of the questions that we've yeah. gotten. Um, you know, this actually comes from our host, DeAndre. You know, we're going to take this video and throughout our presentations, we've used various logos and the, you know, the video for the Velcro video. 
Um, when we upload this video and make it broadly available, both through the VLA and through in education, are we worrying about fair use or are we infringing everybody, um, anybody's rights? So, um, I, you know, I, I offer this purely as um, commentary. This is my own thought. This is not uh, given an, as any kind of legal advice. As um, Ed mentioned, you it, are right, not our lawyer. Like, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I have not analyzed the specific issue, so this is just purely off the cuff. But I think we would have a strong argument that, you know, obviously this, ho this whole entire presentation is for educational purposes, right? Like, you know, we are, we are here to present and to hopefully teach and, um, you know, uh, and help out the artists who participate in Battle of the Teal and all of the, the other, you know, maybe attorneys who are tuning into this um, presentation to try to get, you know, a grounding in, you know, some of these intellectual property concepts that apply to creatives. So, um, you know, I, I think we do, you know, if someone were to, to challenge us on, you know, some of our uses of borrowed material for the purposes of this presentation, I think we would have a strong legal argument um, to say that this is fair use because we're using it for teaching purposes. Um, so that would be, that would be my response. Thanks, Katie. Oh, okay, good. I see, I see DeAndre cheering, so I'm, I'm very, very glad to see that. Um, okay, so with the, just a couple of minutes we have remaining, you know, now that we've kind of gotten, uh, we've, we've laid a little bit of a legal foundation, I want to address some practical tips for, okay, well, that's great, you know, I'm an artist, you know, I, I realize that I have certain rights, um, but there are certain limitations to that. How do I actually go about and share my stuff on the internet um, and, you know, try to get some, some, you know, garner some attention and some interest in my work while also, you know, trying to, you know, protect, protect my rights as well. So a couple of tips and tricks um, for how to share your work smartly online. So, one, one thing that you can do is to give people notice. You know, if, for example, if you're sharing a visual work, you can say, hey, I have a copyright in this. This is a fixed expression. It's an original expression. I am declaring to you, you know, anonymous user on the internet who's maybe looking at something that I've posted, I am, I am making it known to you that I have a copyright in this work. And while certainly it won't necessarily, that alone won't prevent someone from copying or sharing it, it might give um, a user pause bef before they just go ahead willy-nilly sharing your work with other people um, or in other ways that you have not sanctioned um, by, by showing that you, you take you, your your intellectual property rights in your own work seriously um, by, by, you know, providing that notice on your work. Um, you know, it might encourage other people to approach you directly before they just, to ask for permission before they just go ahead and use your work. So an example, um, arguably, these very PowerPoint slides that I'm presenting to you right now are arguably copyrightable because they're fixed, because there's a modicum of, and, and I stress modicum of originality in these PowerPoint slides. You know, what I could do is run a banner along the bottom of each one of these slides with a copyright symbol, the year that I presented these slides, which is 2020, followed by my name. So you can, you know, depending, you know, if it's a, if it's a musical work and you're distributing, you know, uh, discs of that work, you can, you know, put that you know, that copyright notice on the, the front of your disc um, as well. Um, you can find ways to give, um, you know, give people you're sharing your work with notice that I am the copyright holder. The other thing too is just, you know, careful not to give away the story. You know, we're, we're uh, you know, our artists really, you know, so frequently just want to get the word out and, you know, share their work with, with others. Um, but it's important to do it um, thoughtfully. So, for example, one thing that you can do if it's a visual work of art that you want to share is to watermark the image. Um, and so an example of that is on the screen where basically you have the semi-translucent text. You know, this could be the, your copyright notice that you have running over your image. And again, it's a way of sharing your work with other people, but discouraging them from just downloading and sharing the, the particular digital file that you have Share, you know, chosen to share on maybe a personal artist website. Um, another thing is share lower res resolution images of your work. So if someone does want to go ahead and copy it, 
they can, but it's going to be really hard for them to like slap your painting on a t-shirt or a coffee mug or a greeting card and try to sell it because what you're, what you're sharing publicly is so low resolution that it, it discourages infringing uses. Um, you know, uh, you can also, um, you know, try to provide some contact information um, that does make it easy for other people who might want to use your work to get in touch with you and ask for permission. By no means am I advocating putting all of your private, you know, contact information on the internet, but maybe you can create um, a professional email address um, and, you know, to, you know, post that on your personal artist's website and encourage people to get in touch with you there. Um, that can that can help and encourage people to ask permission as opposed to just helping themselves. Um, and then finally, you know, an, another idea is just make strategic choices about what and how much you're sharing. So maybe rather than sharing a full song file, um, you know, an audio file on your, you know, your band's website, maybe just share a snippet. Um, or if you're a visual artist, you know, maybe, you know, you can show your work, but maybe you can show it at kind of an angle um, and, you know, or you can, you can choose um, what types of images you're presenting, again, so that you can get the point across of what your work looks like, but you're not uploading an image that will kind of entice someone to want to like really copy and distribute like that, that image itself. Um, and then, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, Ed kind of mentioned this, but, you know, the, the onus is on the artist to police and monitor how their work is being shared and really to enforce their rights. So, uh, you know, one thing you can do is set Google alerts. You know, if you're, if you're a musician and you've written a song with lyrics um, and you want to kind of track how it, your song is being used online, you know, you can put the song title into Google Alerts or any sort of key lyrics, um, and you can sort of monitor how, you know, how your song is being talked about um, online. Again, just because people are talking about your song does not mean that that is copyright infringement, but it will just give you an opportunity to monitor that use online and take action if necessary. Also, reverse image search searching, if you're a visual artist, um, that's a great way to kind of track how your work is being circulated um, online. But again, just I caution you, um, pause for a moment to consider whether, whether the use that you're observing online actually constitutes fair use. So before you go send a nasty gram to, you know, someone who's maybe, you know, use, using your work, stop to consider is this criticism, is this reporting, is this an educational use? Um, because folks do have the right to do that. And then finally, um, to hopefully bring this home, just a couple of uh, practical tips for using social media and sharing your, your creative expression via social media. So question number one is, you know, if I go ahead and share something on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, do I still, like, have I somehow surrendered my copyright to that work? And the answer is no. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I cannot speak for every single social media platform that exists, but, you know, based on my review of the terms of use for the major platforms, you know, what they what they go ahead and say is that, no, you, you retain your, your copyright to whatever work you're posting on our site. However, you are granting Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, a license to store copies of your image on their servers. They need to do that in order to make their service run. And say, for example, Facebook wants to run a commercial and they want to you know, show examples of some of their users' posts. Well, if you're a user and you post stuff, then Facebook can, you know, maybe use, for example, you know, one of your posts in some TV spot um, without notifying you, without paying you, um, because under the terms of use, you have granted them a license to do that. If you're not comfortable with that, then you should think twice about, um, you know, whether you, whether and how you want to use social media. But the point is, inform yourself, make sure you pay attention to those terms of use and that you're comfortable with them. Um, uh, take a look at that in advance. I'm going to skip those slides. Um, you know, one other thing to be aware of, not only terms of use on social media, but community standards. Um, so many social media platforms, um, you know, in an effort to, you know, restrict really ugly behavior like, um, 
you know, uh, like child pornography and, you know, exploitation of children and things like that, you know, they have certain uh, community standards. For example, um, there are restrictions on um, posting nudity. Um, obviously, lots of artists, um, you know, who, who do life drawing, you know, drawing from live models, um, you know, oft oftentimes nudity is a part of a lot of art. Um, and uh, so you should, you should just be aware that um, Facebook, for example, has certain community standards um, that say if it's a work of art and there's nudity, it, you know, we, we permit that. But um, again, you know, ultimately there are human beings who are behind these, you know, the, the monitoring of, you know, the compliance with these community standards and people make mistakes and sometimes your, your page can get blocked, you know, for, for non-compliance with those community standards. So if that's a problem, um, you know, maybe just be careful about, um, you know, the subject matter, you know, depending on the type of art that you make, um, you know, just keep, keep those community standards in mind um, just to avoid, you know, potentially having Having your account blocked, shut down, um, even temporarily. Okay, um, and then you know, again, you know, by 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 sharing your work online, um, you know, you you're you're potentially reaching a really wide audience. But at the same time, you know, there's the risk. You know, you're giving up a certain amount of control over how your work is being used and shared by other people. So just because you're sharing your work, um, you know, with your friends only, um, you know, your own contacts, doesn't mean that one of your friends couldn't then just post your posting, you know, t completely publicly. Um, so. So it's it can be sort of hard to control the the proliferation of you know, how, how of your images or, or your sound files, et cetera, how these things get shared beyond your own kind of initial community. So again, you know, what do you do about it? Well, you know, I, I would refer you back to those um, monitoring and policing mechanisms, you know, setting those Google alerts, um, running those reverse um, image searches. So again, you can do your best to try to monitor uses um, and, uh, you know, try to, you know, send um, cease and desist requests to those people who might be infringing on your copyright. Um, and with that, I uh, will be happy to address any remaining questions. Um, and if you um, have, have further uh, questions and would like to get in touch, I certainly welcome you to reach out to me as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. So I know that we are supposed to go to 730, um, but we did start a couple of minutes late. So people do want to hang on just for a couple of minutes. Um, we had some questions come through, and I think most of them were addressed through your presentation and yours and Claire's. At, and Ed's and Claire's, of course, as well, too. Um, we did get one question from a viewer who um, says that she started a company and registered it in Virginia. Um, I'm assuming it's a company related to the arts. Um, we might need some clarification with that. Um, but years later, the company stated or started their product with the same name, similar logo, and then they took the, the URL um, once the domain name registration had expired. Now, with the caveat that nobody speaking here is anybody's lawyer, um, is that something that you, in general, would encourage somebody to take action about? You can go to any of our speakers if you want to speak. Just to make sure that I under, understand the, the fact pattern here. So we've got a, you know, a business owner started a business in Virginia, um, you know, somehow this business apparently went dormant um, and so a, another competing business um, you know started creating a similar product or offering a similar service and then eventually was able to capture the first business's URL once um, you know they they you know discontinued um, you know that their their ownership of that registration is that do I have that right Hopefully so, um, coming in from the question, but our, our questioner, if there's any follow-up that you wanted with that too, yeah, it is a design company. Um, well, so my, my, my first just reaction is that, you know, if, um, in, in order to, and you know, Clara's welcome to jump in here too, because, um, you know, her presentation focused on trademark, but, you know, trademark, trademark is, is a source indicator, right? So, you know, a, a trademark, um, you know, it tell it tells consumers where a, where a product has come from, like who has put this out into the world, and so um, and part of 
part of trademark ownership is that you have to still, in order to, to claim a trademark right in you know a logo or a, a business name, et cetera, et cetera, you have to be actively engaged in that business. Like you have to be actively engaged in um, make, you know, making that product, uh, offering that service. If you're no longer doing that, um, then there's you're not a source of a good anymore. You're not a source of a service anymore. Um, and so it's harder. I, I think you're going to have a, an uphill battle of trying to claim that, you know, yes, like I, I remain an active user of this of this trademark. And therefore, you know, I, I have maintained my my rights in it and you competing company are not allowed to use it. Um, so I think it would just, it would really, you know, de depend um, on, um, it would just uh, sort of depend on the facts. Um, but that I, I'm seeing now that the, the commenter has uh, written a follow-up to say that um, he or she is in a different area and that this competitor is in a, like a, a different geographic area. This is this can get really complex really fast. The geographic limitations. Um, so I guess I would I would ask the the questioner, um, you know, have you, you know, have you uh, is is the reach of your company a national reach? Like, do you have customers all over the United States, or are your customers based? for example, in Ohio, um, versus your competitor's customers who might be based in Florida. Um, you know, if, if that's the case, then you might have regional rights to use your particular trademark, but you might not have national rights to do so, in which case, you know, you, you're, you're not going to be able to, um, you know, pursue an infringement claim against that person who's operating in a, a completely different region. So, you know, uh, you know, Bob's Burgers, right? Like you can be Bob's Burgers in Cleveland, Ohio, and, you know, there can be some other guy named Bob in California who opens a burger joint. You, you Bob in Ohio, you can't stop that guy in California from doing that unless, of course, you, you know, have franchises all over the United States, unless you've, re you know, registered for that federal trademark things like that. So, you know, if, if there are some kind of geographical issues there, I would really just encourage, um, you know, the, the person who wrote in, talk to an attorney um, uh, and, you know, lay out the facts and, um, you know, try, try to get some advice um, and, uh, yeah, and try, try to sort through it with, um, with an attorney. Well, that sounds like the perfect place to wrap up and say, since we are the volunteer lawyers for the arts, um, contact an attorney. Um, for those of you who are in the Cleveland area, or like I said, in the Northeast Ohio area, and you would like to seek some legal help, um, please scroll back to my email address that I posted at the beginning of the chat. Um, send me an email. We're happy to give you an application and see if the BLA can help you. If you're outside of the Cleveland area, I strongly encourage you to contact your local bar association um, almost every single bar association across the country has a lawyer referral service where they can refer you to somebody either for very low cost or free of charge to get a consultation and see if that's any legal matter that you want to take any further. Um, we always will say uh, try to get an attorney who is practicing in the state or area where the issue took place. So if your business was in Virginia, get a Virginian lawyer. Um, you know, we did mention that a lot of these, these protection issues are a federal, federal issue other than, rather than a state. Still is always a good idea to check with an attorney um, who is familiar with the laws where the issue took place. Um, with that, I will say thank you so much again to our host, DeAndre, at In Education. Thank you to our panelists, Katie, Ed, and Claire. Um, you've been amazing and wonderful. We encourage you to stay in touch with us. We're going to be doing more presentations on lots of other issues, and we really want to reach out and help the public as much as we can in general, and especially in um, these times under COVID. We want to make sure that we still keep helping the arts community keep us strong and vibrant. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thanks again, and we will talk to you again soon. Take care. So long. Thanks so much.